Hello everyone, thank you for coming today. Our featured speaker today is Dr. Norman Sade. Norman is a professor of School of Computer Science here at CMU, and he's a faculty member at Scilab, director of the Mobile Commerce Lab, and also Norman is the co-founder, chairman, and chief scientist at Wombat Security Technologies, which is a CMU spinoff. And I'm going to hand it over to Norman. Thanks, Norman. Well, um, hello everyone and good afternoon. Enjoy your pizza. Uh, I'd like this, uh, this afternoon to uh, uh, give you an update on some of the work that we've been doing in the context of mobile app uh, security and uh, privacy. I may have more slides than I can afford to present, but uh, uh, we'll see how it goes. And uh, uh, it may turn out that we just focus on the privacy side of things and don't necessarily get a chance to go to the security side of the presentation. We'll see how it goes. and. Uh, uh, let's just uh, get started. So as uh, I think uh, most of us realize, uh, smartphones uh, are commonly uh, adopted these days. If you look, for instance, at uh, what people buy when they uh, renew, when they go and purchase a new phone, about 70% of people buy a smartphone. And uh, these smartphones are particularly popular in part because of all the apps that we can download on them. A recent survey, for instance, from Nielsen showed that an average user has over 40 apps on his or her uh, smartphone. And uh, in the process, as we download these apps, we've effectively uh, given rise to what people have referred to as an app economy. This app economy today generates billions of dollars uh, per year. Uh, it, it's been obviously growing extremely fast, as can be shown here on this uh, graph. Uh, what you can also see on this graph, and so these are, this is a, a figure from about a year ago. Uh, this year, I think Gartner, uh, the latest estimate I've seen is Gartner estimates that uh, uh, this market will reach about $26 billion. So very large uh, numbers, obviously. What's interesting to see is that a meaningful fraction of all this money uh, comes in the form of ads. So there's an entire ad economy also uh, that has uh, taken uh, shape through these apps, uh, through this app ecosystem. And these ads, as you probably know, as well as a number of other third parties that are effectively involved in the delivery of these applications, uh, provide for very interesting data flows and, and a lot of interesting challenges, both from a privacy as well as a security uh, perspective. And uh, if we go back a few years ago, and uh, we reflect on some of the trends that we've seen over the past few years. Obviously, there's been a major competition uh, between the iOS, the Apple, if you want, ecosystem within this space, and also the Android uh, ecosystem. And they've given each other a, uh, a good ride for, for their money. Uh, part of the competition has had to do with how much functionality you would want to give to developers. If you remember in the old days, iOS was actually very conservative. Uh, it started with an environment where you could only run one app at a time. The idea of running background apps was not uh, even conceivable. So if you wanted to, for instance, develop a location sharing app, it was extremely difficult on, uh, for instance, iOS, unless this was an app where the user would push his location. Android took a very different tack from the very beginning and was much more open, effectively trying to make up for the fact that they had started a bit later uh, than Apple. And one way in which you can try to catch up with your uh, main competitor is by trying to obviously generate more content. And they had to catch up. They were behind in terms of number of apps they had available on their app store. And in the way of doing that is in part to say, well, we're going to try to attract more developers. We're going to make this an environment that developers will love to come to because they're going to be able to do a lot more things than they can do with our competitor. And so how did they do that? Well, they did that by exposing a number of APIs early on to developers. Background processing uh, was obviously allowed right away. Uh, the number of APIs they exposed was much greater than Apple. And in effect, Apple had to respond. And one of the trends that we've seen also over the past few years is that the number of APIs, the number of things that you can do if you're an app developer within the iOS ecosystem, that number has increased as well. Right. And so this is all great, and uh, that has effectively given rise to all these apps that we love to download on our smartphones, but has also given rise to some interesting security and privacy challenges. In fact, if you reflect for a minute on the uh, core value proposition between these app stores, uh, the core value proposition is that they should give you access to a wide variety of content so that any one of us, independently of our taste, will find a meaningful number of apps that we'll want to download on our cell phones. But another part of these 
app stores and a big part of uh, their success has to do with issues also of usability and security or trust. Right? In the old days, if you go back 10 years ago, apps existed. Right? Java-enabled cell phones have been around for many years. They were first introduced in 2001, believe it or not. But for a long time, these apps were not terribly successful because an average user would have a terrible time finding these apps and figuring how to download them. And very few of us felt, terribly, felt very comfortable paying for these apps because effectively we're supposed to give potentially credit card details to some random guys in a garage somewhere, people you had never heard of, and that was the best case scenario. Obviously in a worst case scenario, we're giving your credit card details to uh, a malicious entity. Uh, the App Store resolved that by effectively saying, well, you don't need to give your credit card details right, to these random people in the garage. You give us, us being Apple, us being Google, you give us your credit card details. Right? We're the only ones who need to find out about, uh, to have these details. We'll process the payment, and then we'll give a percentage of the revenue to the content providers, to the people who actually developed uh, the app. And so that has worked very well, but obviously as we've uh, sort of uh, introduced all these APIs, we've effectively also uh, put an interesting twist on this notion of trust, right? So the success of these app stores has to do with trust, but now that we've opened up all these APIs to developers, there's a question as to, well, do these app stores still know what these apps are doing? Can they actually verify what's going on, both from a privacy and a security standpoint? And so effectively, this value proposition that was the success of these app stores is coming back in a more complex form today and one of the things that companies like both Apple and Google have had to deal with is how do we re restore this notion of trust? Because the last thing you want, even though Apple and, and Google have grown very nicely, and Google, as you know, has caught up very nicely with iOS in terms of number of apps that they make available to, to users, if you want to maintain that success, you've got to make sure that you don't end up being known as the app store that has poor apps where you're going to get hacked, where your privacy will be uh, endangered. And so, effectively, uh, this issue has, uh, is really behind uh, a number of things that we've seen over the past few years. Those of you who've got the latest version of Android or the latest version of iOS must have noticed some interesting changes as you were moving from one version uh, to the next. And so, as I pointed out, certainly many of these apps, as I think uh, most of you probably know, collect uh, more information that they really need, right? So examples, and you know, there are many more, but uh, Pandora, for instance, gathers your location, gender, year of birth. I don't know why Pandora would need that, right? Uh, path uploads your entire contact list without full content. Brightest flashlight, I don't know if you know how that works. This is essentially something that turns on as many lights as they can find on your, on your cell phone. That requires full internet access, but also your location. Uh, there are Bible apps that also require your location. So all that is very interesting, but I'm not entirely convinced that these apps really need this to actually operate, right? And um, obviously from a privacy standpoint, and this is research that we've done a couple of years ago now, when you tell users about these things, many of them are actually extremely surprised. So uh, this is, for instance, uh, four different apps, and we've done this for a much larger number of apps, four different apps that uh, collect sensitive information, and the percentages that you're seeing here are the percentage of people who are expressing surprise uh, in finding out that effectively this type of information is collected by, by this app. Notice that very few people are, are surprised about the fact that Facebook collects their location but a large num lo much larger number of them are surprised to find out that it's also co collecting their contacts list. Angry Bird, why does Angry Bird need your location? I think we all realize that this is for uh, advertising purposes because we're uh, probably more enlightened than the average user, but uh, a great number of people find, find this very surprising and certainly are very concerned about that. Same story for Pandora or by this flashlight. And so clearly privacy matters and, and people have some concerns about these types of practices. And one of the things that we've seen over the past few years is a direct reflection of this. So one of the things that we've seen is that over the past few years, uh, both Android uh, and iOS have exposed an increasing number of settings uh, to users. Right, so if you've looked, for instance, if you're an iOS user, you might remember that uh, not as long ago, not, not that long ago, perhaps uh, two, two and a half years ago, the only real permission uh, that you were made aware of was location. 
right? You were asked whether or not you were willing uh, to effectively let the phone access your location. Eventually that evolved and it enabled you to uh, do this on an app by app basis. But most recently, for those of you who've got uh, iOS 6 or iOS 7, you might have noticed that these are the kinds of screens that we have. So it's no longer just asking us whether we want to share our location with different apps, but it's also asking us the same question about our contacts, our calendar, reminders, or photos, Bluetooth, microphone, and the screen goes down, actually. You can scroll down. So those of you who are Facebook users or LinkedIn users, I uh, will find also settings for both Facebook and, and, um, and um, LinkedIn. And then as you go and you click on any one of those, let's say that you click on location, you're going to have the ability to toggle things on and off on an app-by-app -app basis, which is great control, right? And uh, there are a number of additional controls that you can play with. So for instance, here, uh, you can play also uh, with, um, actually, I didn't display everything, but there are additional settings that are available uh, where you can decide whether or not you're willing to let Apple, for instance, uh, find out about places where you tend to go frequently. Uh, which can be useful for a variety of different purposes, whether you're willing to share your location for advertising purposes, and so on. And so before you know it, uh, this leads obviously to a fairly large number of settings. Now I might say, well, Android perhaps is not that complex. Well, the truth is that Android uh, actually has an even greater number of APIs. It's around 130 different permissions that are available in Android for uh, developers to request as they build their app. And most recently, this is just uh, basically three, four months ago, uh, in Android 4.3, uh, Android moved away from its original model where effectively you would only find out about these permissions as you were downloading the app on your cell phone. A screen would pop up. Those of you who are Android users know this uh, quite well. A screen would pop up and say, this app you're in the process of downloading right now, it requires access to the following. It requires the following permissions to be granted. Are you okay with this? And most users would obviously say, sure, I'm okay with this because all that they cared about at that particular point in time was to have the app running on their cell phone and privacy was obviously nowhere near uh, the top of their, uh, their list of concerns. Uh, most recently, uh, in June of this year with uh, Android 4.3, um, Google effectively uh, came up with a new set of uh, what they refer to as a permission manager. It's known as App Ops. And effectively, it gives you the very same types of settings as what iOS has made available to its users uh, for now a couple of years. So effectively, now you have the ability to review each one of the apps that you have and to look at the various types of permissions that they might be requesting. So for instance, when you get to Facebook now, you can look at the fact that Facebook might require your location, read your contacts, modify your contacts, read a code log, vibrate, post notification, camera, and you can toggle any one of those on and off. Isn't that wonderful? All right, so, <clears throat> so is this good or bad? Well, I would say it's, actually not bad. It, it's good in the sense that these environments now reflect the fact that, number one, we have concerns, right? And uh, as it turns out, and I'm going to show you this better in a minute, not everyone feels the same way. So it's not like you can actually configure these things ahead of time with one size fits all settings. So it's nice to have the ability now to toggle these things on and off. In principle, it restores some form of control. So this is a move in the right direction, but it's not perfect, far from that, right? So effectively, the number of settings now that you have to manage is extremely high, way higher than a, re than, than a user could realistically be expected to manage. So if you do a quick of the cuff calculation, and this is fairly conservative, so you take those numbers, for instance, from a, a recent Nielsen study showing that an average smartphone user has 41 apps on his or her smart smartphone. And let's say that a typical app requires only three permissions, which is, again, fairly conservative. Just remember those screens I showed you with Facebook, for instance. That would mean that, in principle, you would have to manage 120 settings. And then you would have to toggle these things on and off based on whether or not you feel comfortable disclosing these things. Right? How many of you feel comfortable managing 120 settings? And obviously, this is just for your smartphone. Right? Move on to Facebook, and you probably have another 100. Right? So, uh, obviously, um, this sounds uh, obviously very, very challenging. And the truth is that, believe it or not, these settings do not capture the whole story. Far from that. In fact, if you go back to this uh, screen that I showed you a couple of minutes ago, a lot of the permissions that are being requested have nothing to do with the fact 
that this is what the app requires to operate. A lot of these permissions have to do with a more complex ecosystem within which the app resides. They have to do with the fact that you've got analytic firms that are interested in collecting as much information about you to build sophisticated profiles that they can resell to advertising networks. They've got to do with advertising networks trying to target you as best as possible. They've got to do with social networks, et cetera, et cetera. So what these permission screens today uh, do is they at least give you the ability to control things, but they don't really tell you why a given permission is being requested, which is, as it turns out, an important element for most people when it comes to making decisions as to whether or not they feel comfortable granting those kinds of permissions. In fact, to perhaps better illustrate that, let me tell you about a study that we conducted not too long ago. So this is uh, data that we collected back in, uh, in June of uh, this year. Uh, we looked at uh, 725 uh, smartphone users, Android smartphone users in this case, and uh, we asked them how they felt about granting different permissions to different apps, uh, but telling them also about the purpose for which this information was being requested. You might say, how do you know that? Well, this is an entirely different story. I'm not going to dwell on this. I think I've presented uh, some of this work earlier. This is joint work with uh, Jia Lulin and, and uh, Jason Hong. But uh, one of the things that we discovered is that many of these third parties that are involved in collecting information about us through these apps tend to rely on fairly easily recogni recognizable APIs. Right? And so what you can do is when you, can, you can actually compile the code of many of these apps. And as you do that, Right, you can actually go and do some static analysis and look for the signatures of these different third parties. Uh, there are, there's a relatively small number of them. Uh, I mean, what I mean by small is, I mean, there are dozens and dozens of them, but it's not a huge number. And very quickly, you can actually say, well, this one, that's a well-known social network. This one is a well-known <coughs> advertising network. This one is a well-known analytics company. And you can effectively see why a particular permission is being requested by seeing what happens to that information in the code of the app. If the only thing that happens to your location is that it is sent to an advertising network, then you can infer that this location is not being requested for the app to work, but it's requested for sharing with an advertising network. And so we're able to do that on a large scale. We've actually scanned uh, well over 100,000 Android apps. And uh, using this information, we're then able to generate uh, those studies where we went back to users and we told them, look, this is this app and this is why it's collecting information. Do you feel comfortable with this or not? And as they do that, there are some very interesting uh, results that uh, come out. And so uh, what sort of demographics did we look at? I have to admit that a population of 725 users here was uh, slightly skewed towards uh, the younger people, but uh, certainly didn't completely ignore uh, people in other uh, age groups, and we tried our best to keep it also balanced in terms of uh, uh, gender and relatively decent mix also in terms of uh, education. And so this is what I want to emphasize. So this is a matrix here that shows you the level of comfort that people express on average when asked whether or not they feel comfortable granting permissions different apps, take into account the purpose associated with these different permissions. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing a relatively small, this is a summary, you're seeing a relatively small number of fairly sensitive permissions accessed by an app to your fine location. So this is GPS level uh, type of location. Course location, right, which is much more aggregate. Think about it being a block or coarser than that. Phone state, contacts list, right, all the people that you've called, uh, SMS functionality, and account information, right. And along the horizontal axis here, you've got different purposes that could be associated with these permissions. So in this case here, the first uh, column is the one that ideally you would want to see. Right? Uh, so this is essentially saying the app needs this for internal purposes. Uh, next you see an app requesting this information potentially for advertising purposes, to share with analytics companies or SNS to share with social networking sites. And so what we did across this uh, collection of 725 people and this large number of applications, we tried to see how they felt sharing or granting these permissions, these different apps, based on the fact that these different apps request permissions for different purposes. And we aggregated this data. And this is what we saw. So as you can see here, uh, the redder this gets, 
the, least, the less comfortable people are, and obviously if it's completely white, a score of plus two, then people are extremely comfortable granting this information. So the scale here goes from two to minus two, two being very comfortable, minus two being least uh, comfortable. And as you can tell, uh, and there are a few entries here that just do not exist. So this is what you're seeing here with these horizontal lines. So we just didn't have any such apps in our, in our collection. But what you can see is that in general, when it comes to granting information to apps for internal purposes, people feel reasonably comf comfortable uh, doing that, right? I mean, there are some shades of, of pink, but uh, they're certainly not extremely dark. And uh, basically, as you can tell here, we never get below minus 0.09, right? So you're only very slightly uncomfortable sometimes when it comes, for instance, to sharing your contacts list or granting SMS functionality to an app. But by and large, when it comes to the app needing this information or this functionality purely for it to operate, people will generally feel pretty comfortable. When it comes to advertising, it's a different story. You can see now that we're getting some much darker shades of gray. So for instance, very few people feel comfortable granting access to their contacts list to advertising companies. That's a minus 0.97. Uh, similar levels of uh, lack of comfort when it comes to sharing with analytics firms, and some level of discomfort also when it comes to sharing things such as contacts lists, for instance, with social networking <coughs> sites. So what this shows you is that purpose matters, right, as I pointed out. Purpose matters. People will not as if feel comfortable granting these things if the purpose is other than internal use. Right? But these permission screens, however fancy they might be today, just do not disclose this information. So I, a user, will be lacking a key piece of information that ultimately would determine whether or not I feel comfortable sharing this information. Now you might say, okay, uh, couldn't we just use this information and potentially come up with defaults for users? Right? So after all, if I see here that people feel extremely uncomfortable granting their contacts information uh, to advertising networks, perhaps we could just set this to do not disclose by default. Not a bad idea, especially anyone in this room who is uh, uh, security minded will certainly agree that by default denying everything may not be a bad, a bad decision. Right. But again, keep in mind that we're dealing potentially with 120 permissions for people to configure. And uh, admittedly, if you go too far in one direction, people will have to effectively modify many, many of these settings. So uh, rather than trying to uh, come up with default one-size-fits-all settings, one question that we've asked ourselves is, well, could we potentially you know, come up with settings that would work well for different groups of users? And uh, before we get to that, the first question you've got to ask yourself is, well, first of all, if these are the average, you know, levels of comfort that we're registering for users, how much variation do we have within our population? Right. And so in terms of variation, this is what you're seeing. So this graph here effectively shows you levels of um, disagreement within a given population. So the darker shades of yellow indicate effectively a large variance, and the uh, lower shades of uh, yellow or leading towards uh, white indicate that people tend to agree. So look, for instance, at fine location, which is your top left uh, corner entry here. Uh, the, the variance is fairly low, 0.79, right? So by and large, people feel relatively comfortable sharing the location with an application for internal purpose. Course location, uh, agreement is even higher, and comfort is even higher, right? But now move to, for instance, contacts list, which was actually the area where people on average felt the least comfortable. And notice that our variance is actually at its highest. We've got a variance of 2.30. That means that there are actually people out there who don't feel comfortable at all with this, but there are people who might actually feel comfortable granting this information, right? So not everyone feels the same way. And so clearly based on these types of figures, you can tell that this one size fits all default that you know, you could potentially say, okay, I'm just gonna come up with good defaults for everyone, and then they can tweak a little bit. That's not likely to work extremely well. <coughs> we might need to be more sophisticated than that. And so we ask ourselves, well, if, if that's the case, then, you know, could we potentially identify a small number of clusters of like-minded users? And so why did we ask ourselves this question? Well, uh, a lot of our work prior to wor working on mobile apps revolved around location sharing. 
And with location sharing, we also identified very similar types of results. We found that people's privacy preferences were very diverse, but that it was possible to identify a relatively small number of clusters of users that felt uh, that, that had very similar types of preferences. And that as a result, we could define a relatively small number of profiles or defaults for these different clusters of users and get them pretty close to their level of comfort, effectively significantly reducing the amount of configuration that they would have to do. And so one of the things we wanted to do in our research is to see to what extent a similar kind of um, finding uh, was, uh, would potentially emerge from looking at these uh, types of preferences as well. So could we define a small number of privacy profiles that could help predict a user's privacy preferences? And so uh, to look into these things, what you do is you take all these data that you've collected and you apply clustering techniques. And I'm not going to bore you with details about the clustering techniques that we've used, except to say that we've uh, focused on there are lots of clustering techniques out there. Uh, it's actually quite unbelievable to see how many how, how innovative uh, and creative people have been in, in working on clustering techniques. But one of the things that we wanted to do was to find, to focus on clustering techniques that are more organic in nature. We wanted to see, let the data speak rather than try to impose uh, too many constraints on the data. And a good approach to doing that is to actually use what people refer to as hierarchical clustering techniques. And you can play with different distance metrics and all these sorts of things. I'm not going to bore you with that. But as you apply this, uh, you can actually identify and you can play with the number of clusters that you end up with. But if you sort of let the data speak, by and large, you see that you end up with about four different types of clusters of users. And these users, these clusters of users, are actually users that are fairly easy to understand when it comes to interpreting their preferences. We've actually labeled them. So we found that there is a group of users that's very conservative, people who just don't like to disclose much information. Right. Then you've got uh, people who are by and large, unconcerned. So those are the people who are going to say, I don't mind sharing my contacts list right, with advertiser, advertisers and, and third-party uh, analytic comp analytics companies, et cetera. Then you've got fan sitters that are sort of more in between, and I'll show you what that means in a minute. And then we've also identified more advanced users, and I'll show you what that means when you look at these things more closely. So um, if you look, for instance, at a high level at these different groups, so the the, the unconcerned in our uh, data represent about 23% of our population. Uh, the conservatives about 11.9%. The fan sitters are the, the majority, I mean, not the majority, but close to being half of the population, about 47%. And then we've identified about 18% 80, of users being more advanced. So how do these people differentiate? Uh, how, how do they uh, differ from one another? Well, the, the, the um, the conservatives are basically people who just don't like to share anything with external libraries, the, the third parties that we've been talking about. Right? The unconcerned, as I pointed out, they feel comfortable disclosing pretty much anything to anyone. Right? The, uh, the fan sitters will tend to be uh, more neutral when it comes, for instance, to sharing with advertising networks or mobile analytics firms. Um, but uh, when it comes to SNS, they're pretty comfortable. Uh, and then finally, the, the more advanced users, you see when it becomes interesting, they just don't like the idea of sharing with uh, uh, advertising networks, mobile entity comp companies, but they're okay with social networking sites, uh, for instance. And they're also okay disclosing course location, but they're more concerned about fine location. Uh, we can actually look at this in a bit more detail if you're curious. So uh, the unconcern, so this is where you would expect to see uh, the, the lighter shades of red, right? And, and uh, moving towards uh, pink. And as you can see here, uh, effectively, um, you know, not a huge amount of concern, even granting their fine location to advertising networks, right? Look at the first line, advertising networks here, right? 0.5 analytics companies, social networking system. So these are people who clearly don't find that it's a huge deal to share this sort of information. Even their contact information, they feel pretty comfortable sharing with uh, social networking sites, analytics firms again, uh, ads, advertising networks, etc. So if we move on to the next group, for instance, the fence sitters, right, we're seeing a somewhat uh, different picture. Notice, for instance, that when it comes to their location, 
right, which is the second entry at the top here, the minus 0.33, these people feel very differently about sharing their location, their fine location at least, with advertising networks. But when it comes to their course location, which is much less revealing, they're actually okay, right? That's essentially what a fan sitter would be. Um, the conservatives, as could be expected, you see a lot of dark, dark red here. So those are people who are not very keen to share much. In fact, even when it comes to sharing with apps for internal purposes, right? So this is the app requires access to your SMS functionality, minus one, right? The app requires access to your phone state, minus 0.56. Notice, however, that they're still willing to share their fine location, which is very interesting. So a lot of people feel comfortable apparently sharing their fine location with apps when it's for internal purposes, right? And then finally, the, the more advanced users, which for some reason I seem to have skipped, so I don't have that slide. Uh, but the more advanced users, as I pointed out, tend to be much more selective. So they're going to differentiate even more between fine location, for instance, and course location. They're going to be okay doing certain things with their course location, but not so much so with, with their fine location. Right. So um, obviously, now the question is, okay, that now that we've identified these profiles, right, could we somehow simplify uh, permission interfaces? Could we somehow use these findings to configure for users many of these settings that otherwise would be absolutely unmanageable, right? These 120 permission settings that we talked about earlier. And so we've been playing with ways of asking questions, for instance, to identify in which cluster a user belongs, right? So how many questions do you need to ask people? As it turns out, you don't need to ask that many questions, right? And as you do that, and if you compare, for instance, mean square errors, right? So if you start with your baseline, which is the one size fits all uh, sort of uh, profile, uh, your mean square error is about 0.68, which is obviously unacceptable. If you were to just ask one question, right, which is obviously not sufficient to differentiate between the different clusters, you'd go down to 0.44, which is obviously progress. You ask more than that, you're getting to 0.32. So that sounds promising, but it's not really sufficient. I don't think that as a user I would be entirely satisfied just relying on that, right? And so the next question then is, well, could we somehow develop hybrid solutions? Could we be a bit smarter? At the end of the day, maybe it's not just about trying to predict everything automatically. Perhaps we could come up with models where we try to predict a number of things, right, but we're not sure about our prediction. We go and ask the users. How many questions would we have to ask those users if we wanted to get a very high level of accuracy, let's say over 90% or perhaps even 95% accuracy? Is that possible? As it turns out, uh, our results, and this is very recent, our results suggest that it is. So our results suggest that while people's preferences are fairly diverse, you can actually do a fairly decent job at predicting your preferences. And so here's what we've done uh, in this space. And, and uh, to explore this, uh, and this is work that we just submitted recently at a conference uh, called Dub Dub Dub. Uh, so to, uh, to explore this, we've actually looked at a much larger data set. So we looked at uh, an application that has been around now for uh, a couple of years. It's called LB Privacy Guard. And it's uh, an application that has been available uh, for uh, people who've got rooted Android phones. Uh, they've got a few million users, and they're willing to uh, share their data with us, effectively allowing us access to take a look at the settings selected by the users. And so we uh, use that as effectively ground truth with some pre-processing to extract data that didn't necessarily seem to be very relevant, such as users that were not truly engaged with the app and those kinds of things. And uh, in particular, uh, LB Privacy Guard allows you to uh, manipulate about 12 permissions. Again, the, the, the types of sensitive permissions that we're looking for in particular. So this includes SMS, phone call, phone state, call monitoring, SMS database, contacts list, call logs, positioning, phone ID, uh, etc. And the settings uh, by default are allow, deny, or ask, right? And so we were able to effectively obtain data from a fairly large number of users. Uh, these users effectively have access to screens like this, right, where they can effectively on an app by app basis uh, decide whether or not to grant uh, certain types of uh, permissions, just as we've seen emerging uh, just over the past four months in the context of uh, uh, Android 4.3. So effect, in effect, these guys were ahead of the curve. Right, they had anticipated uh, what the market would do, what uh, Android and iOS would do, and they're giving us the ability to see what happens when you essentially make those kinds of settings available uh, to users. 
And um, sort of uh, to make a long story short here, uh, we uh, looked at this data set and uh, we had about 4.8 million users, uh, about 500,000 apps used by these users, and uh, something like 159 million decision records, uh, which is a, a meaningful amount of data, uh, obviously. Um, you know, is this population entirely representative of the population at large? Probably not, but certainly if you find some patterns within a population like that, it's certainly an indication that you're likely to find somewhat similar, perhaps not exactly the same patterns in the population uh, at large. And so uh, we did a bit more pre-processing. So we didn't use all 4.8 million of those users. As I said, some users are not necessarily entirely engaged with these apps. And we wanted to make sure that we converge on users that they had effectively spent enough time interacting with these settings so that we could use these settings as effectively ground truth. Right, what would it take? And so uh, there are a number of assumptions that I don't necessarily have the time to go into all the details here. But after doing a, a good amount of uh, um, spring cleaning, if you want, and, and, uh, and pre-processing, we still ended up with 240,000 users, uh, 12,000 apps, and 28 million records, which is obviously uh, still a very meaningful uh, corpus. And when you look at this uh, data, uh, you find that uh, those users um, had about 22.6 apps on average, so this is uh, excluding, excluding internal apps. Uh, on average, about uh, a little over three permissions uh, per app. So obviously not all permissions are requested by all apps. And a fairly nice distribution between allow and deny for each one of the app permissions uh, that we had in this data set. Another interesting uh, thing to look at is what about level of agreement between all these users? And so, again, as we had seen earlier with our smart data set, uh, you don't have a huge amount of agreement. So, for instance, if agreement means 80% of the users have the same setting, you find that that's only true for about less than two-thirds of the app permissions. Right? So there is some level of agreement, but not huge. And, uh, you know, if you uh, wanted to... Uh, so that, that's roughly what we saw there. Um, and so we proceeded to analyze this. And um, we applied some machine learning techniques. I'm not going to sort of uh, dwell on all the details, otherwise I'm never going to get where I want to get. But um, here's the, the chart that's the most meaningful chart. So we've, we built some uh, models, some classifiers, basically using machine learning techniques. And we looked at uh, two different alternatives. One is to see whether we can predict uh, selections that people would make based on information such as, you know, what do other users select? for this app in terms of permissions. And uh, we also looked at decisions made by the user for 20% uh, of the apps that it would end up downloading on their phone. So we said, let's look at the settings that people pick for 20% of their apps, and let's see if we can predict the settings that it would want to have for the other 80% of their apps. And we did this in two different ways. One was to see if we could fully predict things, and the other one was to see if we could do a better job by selectively asking users what uh, permissions they were willing to grant based on whether or not our own prediction seemed to be credible or not. So how much confidence did we have in our own prediction? Where the confidence level was too low, then we'd go ahead and prompt the user and effectively use essentially the answer that the user had selected as the correct answer. And what you find here is effectively two different curves. So you find one where we try to predict everything on our own automatically, and one where we had this more interactive, or what I call this hybrid method, where you try to predict as much as you can, but when your confidence level is too low, then you go and ask the user, right? And this is essentially playing with the percentage of questions that you're allowing yourself to ask the user. And so if you're allowing yourself, for instance, to um, ask only uh, you know, zero questions to users, then you're getting to an accuracy of about 88%. Not bad, but potentially not enough for people to start uh, with those kinds of settings. Now, if you ask, allow yourself to say, okay, well, I'm willing to ask questions to users for up to 10% of the app permissions they're going to have to configure, then your accuracy level jumps to about 92%. Now, you might say, well, that sounds like a huge number of questions I would have to ask users. Well, not really. Keep in mind that these users had about 20 apps, right? And I'm talking about effectively three permissions per app, so that's about 60 permissions. 10% of that is asking these users six questions. I'm going to ask them six questions, and I'm going to be able to predict everything else with 92% accuracy. That's not bad. If you go up to 20%, which means asking about 12 questions, right, which is still a lot less than the number of permissions they would have to answer, you're getting to about 94% accuracy. Now, these are still early results. 
uh, we strongly believe that uh, uh, if we were to make our machine learning uh, solutions a bit more sophisticated, we could further boost this uh, accuracy. And so this, we feel, is getting pretty promising, right? If you could get to 94, 95% accuracy, right, uh, by just asking users a relatively small number of questions and effectively configuring all these other permissions on their behalf, I think that you would have achieved uh, ex extensive uh, progress in terms of lowering user burden, enabling them effectively to have settings that they feel comfortable with without having to toggle all these different permissions on and off and basically being 95% of the time correct. And it's easy to actually come up with additional mechanisms that would further boost these sorts of things. You can also play with profiles with this data. I'm not gonna bore you with all the details, but we sort of did similar types of analysis. We played with the number of clusters and those kinds of things. And, and so these are results that show you how you could potentially differentiate between different groups of users based on these kinds of permissions. So again here, this is an example with three profiles instead of the four that I showed you earlier. So with these three profiles, you can see, for instance, that profile one here is a profile that distinguishes itself by granting pretty much everything. So these uh, little uh, check marks here in green show that these are permissions that these users were willing to grant, right? And you find that uh, basically uh, that's the fingerprint of that uh, profile or that cluster number one. Uh, cluster two is a, a cluster where you can see it's a bit more of a mixed bag of uh, settings where you're willing to grant certain things but not necessarily others. In particular, call log seems to be a big concern to users in that uh, profile. And then finally, profile three is a more sophisticated profile where as you can see here, uh, users have uh, more sophisticated types of preferences and are also are uh, going to tend to deny a few more things than uh, people in profile two. So those are the kinds of things. So it's nice to see that even as you move from one data set to another, uh, you find very similar types of properties when it comes to these, to these types of preferences. So uh, what I wanted to say, and uh, we'll see how far we can go with the other part of this presentation. One, what I wanted to show you is that uh, what, one of the things that we've seen over the past few years in this space is that obviously all these apps are trying to collect a huge amount of information about you. Uh, a lot of this collection is not needed by the app itself, but has to do with sharing with third parties. People are clearly concerned about these things, on average at least. And um, the number of permissions that you would have to configure these days to effectively manage these things is way higher than is realistic to expect from, from, from users. Uh, nevertheless, that has been the trend, and it's good to see that trend. It's good to see that effectively both Android and iOS have recognized the fact that this is sensitive information and that the only way to properly manage this is to give users control over this information. But the end result of this recognition has been this explosion in, in number of settings, uh, which makes this whole approach entirely unmanageable. And this is not unique to mobile apps, right? So we're seeing the same thing on Facebook, right? You're seeing the same thing on your cell phone in general. It's not limited just to permissions. You're seeing the same thing across uh, all sorts of other environments. Think about your browser and the number of settings that you've got to configure. And not all of us feel the same way about the browsers. When we go incognito and when we don't, uh, some of the security options, whether you want to have Java enabled or not. I mean, there are just so many different settings there. Think about all these apps. Think also about Facebook apps. Think about uh, Chrome apps, right? So there are tons and tons of environments where effectively, <coughs> as you know, we collect more and more information through these different apps and through these different environments, you've got the only way you can properly manage these things is by exposing tons of settings to users, something that's absolutely unrealistic, right? If we're not going to manage 120 settings just for mobile apps on our smartphones, right? What are the chances that we're going to manage a thousand settings across all these different tools that we're interacting with? Absolutely zero, I would say. And so we badly need technology like this that can somehow provide us with the level of comfort that we need, yet can customize these settings for us most of the time and selectively potentially ask questions when it's not entirely sure. And so our work in this area, our longer term work in this area, is uh, the development of what we call personalized privacy assistance. So the idea is that these assistants will uh, work with you over time and will learn your preferences by matching you against different types of profiles, but occasionally also check with you, occasionally remind you also of things that are happening in the background. 
Did you know that among all the different apps that you've downloaded on your smartphone, your location was shared 100 times over the past 24 hours? How do you feel about that? Would you like to revisit a few things? Right. Those are the kinds of things that you could do. This touches on uh, another area for research that we refer to as nudging users. Uh, it's been shown that uh, depending on what you tell users, they're going to feel very differently about some of these decisions. They might often uh, overlook many considerations until you tell them about the implications. Right. And so you can try to nudge users to better reflect on what they're doing and to potentially rethink some of the decisions that they've made. Right. That would make a big difference in terms of minimizing future regret. The chance that you're going to uh, you know, look at those pictures you posted on Facebook two years ago and say, oh, I really wish I hadn't done that, but it's too late. Right. So those are the kinds of things uh, that we're talking about. So learning user preferences, engaging in dialogues with users, and ultimately, these privacy assistants should not be limited to just helping you manage your mobile app uh, permissions. Because my best guess, we've not been able to validate that yet, but my best guess is that those profiles that I showed you for mobile apps, I would find probably very similar profiles for Facebook. <coughs> would probably find very similar profiles for, for your browser. And so if I could build profiles across all these different apps, I could actually even further reduce the number of settings that you would have to configure. So that's effectively what we've been doing in this space. I had uh, an entirely different uh, presentation that I wanted to uh, uh, cover over the, the second half of this presentation. But looking at the time, I'm thinking that maybe we should open up for uh, uh, questions and discussions, and I'll be happy to come back and talk about the other part of my presentation some other time. What do you think? You have 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes. Do you see me going through 30 slides in 10 minutes? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, unless you're going to try and you know, develop all the code that you rely on, you're gonna, there's going to be a need for some kind of trust somewhere. Right? And I think that's actually a, a major uh, you know, niche for some players. In fact, many players are trying to establish themselves as you know, your trusted advisor for, for, for these sorts of decisions, including companies like Google. Right? Uh, they would love to, I mean, think about single sign-on. Right? Think about your ability nowadays to sign in to a variety of different apps using your, your Google, Google credentials or your Facebook credentials. That's a move by these companies to establish themselves as effectively the company that will authenticate you, that will manage many of these uh, profiles on your behalf. So these companies already have that vision. Are they necessarily the companies that you will trust? Well, that's a decision for you to make, and uh, you know, it will be up to them to show you that you, know, you can trust them for, for that purpose. But you could also envision entirely new third parties. And there are some companies that have popped up over the past few years uh, that effectively are trying to fill in this, uh, are trying to essentially take advantage of this opportunity. There's really an opportunity, I think, to help users manage all these different kinds of environments. Well, uh, so that's uh, research we still need to conduct. Uh, we've actually done uh, some of this research in the context of location sharing. And uh, in general, the responses were very good. Uh, we've seen, actually, there are, there are a few um, apps out there. So one of my colleagues, Yuvraj Agarwal, uh, developed something called PMP, which is Protect My Privacy. And it's a, a, a permission uh, manager for jailbroken iPhones that does something very similar. It provides recommendations. The recommendations it provides are actually those one-size-fits-all recommendations that I said are not sufficient. But by and large, response uh, to these sorts of recommendations have been very positive. So people realize that this is way more than they can cope with. And so they're looking for a trusted uh, party to you know, help them manage all these different settings. That would be my best guess. Now, I think additional experimentation needs to be done. And there are clearly different ways of managing these uh, processes. And if you make it too creepy, or if it's not clear whether or not you're sharing some of this information with third parties yourself for other purposes, then I can easily see this falling apart. So uh, you're going to really need a trusted you know, entity taking charge of these things and making it very clear that it's only going to be doing this for the purpose of helping you manage these settings and nothing else. Right? Other questions? 
Yes, go ahead. Uh, it's often more about data uses than data collection. And uh, the type of permissions that uh, a user can normally configure are mostly based on what type of data to disclose and not necessarily on how the data is used. Uh, how do you see this approach of uh, having personalized assistance <coughs> with also the combination of, or the complexity of understanding data uses more than just data disclosure? Well, all these things are very challenging, but uh, you can certainly, you know, I, I just uh, downloaded the, ver the latest version of iOS on my cell phone uh, over the weekend. So this, there's this new version of iOS 7. And it's interesting to see that, you know, a number of screens have actually changed even, you know, within iOS 7 going from, from one incremental version uh, to the next. And that includes actually providing people with additional explanations. So clearly people are seeing a need for doing that. From a privacy standpoint, you know, uh, this whole idea of uh, notice and choice, right, implies that you can make an informed decision. And so there's no way around this. Uh, what you can do, however, is you can try to effectively reduce the number of decisions users have to make up front, try to capture, you know, their preferences and effectively configure things on their behalf while providing them with some kind of, you know, ability to look into what's going on ask additional questions and potentially modify things. But it's a, there's, a, there's clearly a, a very uh, big challenge in managing your information because these scenarios are very complex. The number of these scenarios continues to increase. The variety of third parties that you're seeing and the different things that they're doing continues to become uh, you know, increasingly sophisticated. So how does a regular user keep up with all that? How do you ensure that somehow you know, uh, the user is still in control of his or her data? extremely challenging and, and I think there's room for a lot of research in this space with these privacy assistants. But effectively what we're looking for is very selective dialogues. You don't want a privacy assistant that warns you every minute, oh, your location was shared again, you're at an another app did this or another app did that. So you need to find dialogues at a level that are going to be meaningful for the user. A lot of that will probably involve providing high-level summaries and offering user through dialogue again the ability to ask questions oh, you want to find out more about that. Tell me a bit more about, you know, uh, the fact that my location at this particular point in time was shared, you know, with so-and-so, uh, um, you know, and, and so you might want to be able to drill down, but most of the time you will not. Most of the time you say, okay, fine, nothing different here, nothing to be extremely excited about. By and large, I feel that my settings are doing what I want. Okay, perhaps time for one more question. Yes, go ahead. Um, I would like to ask, so uh, in the beginning you, you showed these capabilities that all these applications were asking for, and you had the ad networks, for instance, and that got me thinking, why would they want the application? So at least the way I understand it is the application developers want to have these connections with the ad networks for extra revenues. I presume they're getting money out of it. So I'm wondering if we get into a point where we're actually able to block these um, specific APIs, are we going to have a different, are we going to force the developers to hide these um, abilities within the, uh, the actual functionality of the application because if they're actually making money out of it, maybe they don't want these uh, abilities to be blocked. Okay. So that's, that's, that's where technology has its limitations and, and where there's room for the law, right? And so this is why these uh, settings and, and this technology will never be a substitute for privacy policies. Right. In fact, one of the recent developments is that, uh, for instance, the uh, AG, the Attorney General in California, signed an agreement uh, about a year and a half ago with uh, many of the top uh, mobile app stores, requiring them to know have uh, developers uh, provide privacy policies for their apps. Right. And so even at that point, once you've got a privacy policy and that policy addresses key questions, and I think there's still work that needs to be done in terms of making sure that the policy does address all the key points rather than saying, this is my privacy policy and I leave it to you to guess everything else, which would clearly not be legal, but uh, you can see how one could certainly, you know, uh, be a little bit vague about certain types of issues. Uh, so there's certainly room for these privacy policies to become more specific over time. But once you've got a privacy policy, and let's say that this privacy policy does a decent job at addressing all these points, then you know you no longer have obviously the right or you're going to get in big trouble if you try to circumvent what your privacy policy states because that 
that basically falls under uh, you know, the FTC and uh, you're basically uh, no longer engaging in, in, fair trade, in fair trade practices at that point. Okay, I propose that uh, perhaps we stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>